announcements. Final, Monday coming. Official time, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. right here. This room. But, if you show up by quarter to three, I'll let you start then. And I'll let you work till 5.15. Don't tell anybody. This is to your benefit. As far as I'm concerned, university has no business setting time limits for exams. They don't teach the courses. People like myself do. And we should have the right and privilege to set time limits for exams. Coverable material through the stuff we are presently dealing with. Rationalizing strengths of acids and bases. If you look at past exams, you will of course see that many of the questions deal with chapter 24 stuff. We're not gonna get there. So, no questions on that on the final. I'm gonna ask you questions about stuff which we do not have time to discuss in class. That is not fair nor reasonable. Next, many of you noticed that scores increased for exam two. That's because I had a messed up question. I also had a messed up question on this exam. I will not penalize you folks for blunders that I make. So for the messed up questions, without any simple way to resolve the issue, I just give everybody credit for the question I messed up. Enough said. That applies to exam two, that's why the scores went up. And that also applies to exam three. Because on the oxidation state question, I forgot to include the correct answer. Except for a few of you who took the exam on Monday where I fixed the exam. But still everybody got credit for that question. Exam three key is posted. Special quiz three is now available. And, I am telling you that along with Special Quiz 3, the due date for which will be this Friday, I shall expect you to submit in behalf of your discussion instructor an evaluation form. Now the evaluation form on your part is anonymous, but on Friday I'll have a place here where you can, ex where you can stack Special Quiz 3, along with the evaluation form for your discussion TA. That's Mackenzie and Lynn Fahm and James uh, Sternberg and Katie Poole. That's our four folks. Evaluations are important. I hope you will take time to say something about the class itself and me with now the online evaluation system that UF has cooked up. It's in your behalf. I find the evaluations that I get interesting. They're rather like goalposts. There's not much in between. It seems as if folks love me or hate me. Nothing in between. I'm either the greatest thing that ever was or the most horrible beast that ever walked the grasses of US, UF campus. <laughs> I'm interested in you learning and in order for you to learn you have to work. And you know this by now about me. Any person who enters my class who's not of a mind to roll up his or her intellectual sleeves and get to work is in the wrong place. And if they want to scream about me in the evaluation process, I don't give a damn. To me, that's a plus. I take that as a compliment. And when I see students who comment on that in the evaluation process, when I have students come back to me after they've done well in organic or analytical, saying how well they were prepared during this class, even though in certain cases they hated my guts during this class because I had to work like hell. 
I say, good, because it's for you. The educational process is for you. You're the future of this country. And I want to make you as intellectually strong and capable as I can. And every class you take at university should do just that, but I know many of them do not. That's sad and unfortunate. I have no control over those activities, none whatsoever. But over this activity, that's different. So here, we make every effort to learn. That's what it's about. And when I'm going, when I'm in the class, that's what it will always be about. There's no other way to learn. If you don't think, you do not learn, period. Now then, unfortunately, I have a doctor's appointment today at 1.15, so I'll have no office hour immediately following class today. But I'll be back. The doctors usually delink in about an hour. They take their time. I will conduct office time as soon as I get back. I hope by 2.30, I can't say. So for those of you who would be of a mind to see me later this afternoon, I'll do the best I can to be available for as long as I can. But I can't do that till I get back. So don't traipse with me back to the office today after class because I'm going to have to run in, throw my notes down, and run off. And one more statement. Likely you've noticed the statement that's in the syllabus about the impact on your letter grade for this gathering that a strong performance on your part can have based on the final exam. Strong performance on the final exam. Simply put, the final exam is cumulative. After I invent it, I'll provide some hints and information regarding the nature of the final. I'll tell you which questions and problems to go back and look at from past exams and quizzes. I can't do that till I write the damn thing. But after I write it, I'll tell you that. Now that probably won't be achieved until Sunday, but that's better than nothing. I'll do the best I can. But given that it's cumulative, and given that we have played with a no-holds-barred set of regulations, it strikes me that if you can do a strong job on the final, you're showing me at least to a significant extent that now you've got it together. And I take that into strong account when I sit down and scratch my head on what letter grade do I write down for this person. At the minimum, you always will get the grade that corresponds to the number of total points which you've earned, just like the syllabus says. But with a strong performance on the final, you can go up above that statistically based letter grade. So your job is simply to do the best you can. Under no circumstances, come to see me and ask questions like, what do I have to make? Because my answer is A, a perfect score, and B, get the hell out of here because I'm not interested in talking to you as C, a budding lawyer. This is not negotiable. The decision rests with me. Your job is to impress me. You want to impress me? Do a good job. The better job you do, the more impressed I shall be. And, as I've already reminded you, as I do each term, we'll run a review. If during the review, which is usually the case, you wish to ask questions that come from past exams or quizzes, bring the quizzes, exams with you, because I'll have my stack as such, so that if you ask a question, you can tell me which exam and which, which question, so I can go right to it. And then I can share that information with everybody. Because it's pointless to respond to a question from a member of the audience which will provide information only to the person that asked the question. It's my job to run response, to provide response, review, 
so that everybody will have the chance to benefit from such. We'll do this for two hours. Because Mitchell isn't going to do anything for this 2045 class. So our review gang gathering, pardon me, for this Friday will start at our usual class time and continue on through period six. All right. Now then, to finish up our considerations regarding assessment of factors which influence the strength of Bronsted Lowry acids. But the factors that we are considering used to assess effective negative charge density of the conjugate base of the acid in question. Because we know from conjugate theory, if we have a strength order for a series of conjugate bases, at the same time we have a strength order for the corresponding conjugate acids of these bases. Here are the considerations which you have so far looked at, with the exception of this, which we'll talk about in a few moments. Solvation is important, but only when you're dealing with a particular acid and the strength which it shows when you observe its strength in different solvents. That's really not applicable to us because the only solvent that we are paying attention to is water. This will be particularly important in organic class for those of you who are heading there, and I know a lot of you are heading there. Now another issue. Yesterday in discussion class, two acids whose relative strengths you were asked to consider were these two. Well, as is always the case, since the criterion which we use for strength assessment is negative charge density for the conjugate base, I write the Lewis picture for the conjugate base nitrate ion of nitric acid molecule. And I write the Lewis picture for the conjugate base of this, the chloric acid molecule. At this stage of the game, I see a lot of similarities. The central atoms have electronegativities which are about the same. Nitrogen and chlorine have about the same electronegativity. They have negative charge density stabilization as a consequence of each of these three, uh, each of these two species having three peripheral oxo-oxygens. Next to fluorine, oxygen is the next strongest atom at stabilizing negative charge density by which of these? Hmm? Is it this? Yes. Right? Induction. An electronegativity effect that's exerted through the covalent bond skeleton of the species. Now, it's also true that orbital electronegativity applies, but that's going to be the same because in each case we have negative charge density on oxygen atoms and resonance, particularly for nitrate ion. What about resonance for this species? The chlorate ion. Well, at a glance we can see that if I take this Lewis picture and rewrite it as this Lewis picture, I reduce formal charge distribution considerably. And then I recognize that this chlorine atom for this Lewis picture has got one, two, three, four, five electron pairs in its valence environment. Is that a violation of anything? P 
people who don't understand the octet rule might consider this a violation. To which atoms in the periodic system, in a covalent bond network, to which atoms in the periodic system does the octet rule rigorously apply? Period two. Which atoms in period two? Carbon? Nitrogen? Nitrogen? Oxygen. And only if, which is usually the case, the carbon and or nitrogen and or oxygen atoms are part of a species which has what kind of a valence electron count? An even number. Even electron species. That's what even electron species means. The sum total of valence electrons is an even number. In such species, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, exclusively and only octet. So there's your octet rule in truth. Most textbooks that I've seen, they don't know this. <laughs> One more reason why I'm not using them damn general chemistry textbooks in this class. They got too much important stuff either left out or screwed up. Either way, you lose. How many valence orbitals does chlorine have, given that it's an atomic member of period three? We did this at the end of chapter 19. How many valence orbitals does chlorine have, since it's an atomic member of period three? Tell me. We did this at the end of chapter 19. Now let's do it again. I'm listening. Chlorine, like all atomic members of period three, have how many valence orbitals? How many? Well, let's look at the sublevels. 3s, 3p, and 3d. S sublevel, single orbital sublevel. P sublevel, how many orbitals? Three. D sublevel, how many orbitals? Nine. That's nine orbitals, damn it. That's an 18 electron capacity. So when I write a Lewis picture with chlorine atom as the central atom, where it shows 10 electrons in its valence environment, who cares? It can go up to 18. So let's play this game again. And now, I reduced the formal charge distribution to the maximum extent. Preferentially, the formal charge is on oxygen rather than chlorine, because oxygen is more electronegative than chlorine, just as it is for the nitrate ion. The question is, how effectively, how accurately, does this Lewis picture, or this Lewis picture, represent the true valence electron structure for chlorate ion? How important is resonance? Because if resonance for chlorate ion is just as important as resonance for nitrate ion, this will be the more stable base. This will have a lower negative charge concentration because it's a bigger species because chlorine atom is bigger than nitrogen. Well, what's the facts? Ah, this acid is a good deal stronger than this acid. So what's going on here? What's going on here? What about central atom oxidation state? How do the central atom oxidation states compare for these species? Now listening. Can you parcel the electrons in your mind's eye while looking at this? It's not difficult. How do the central atom oxidation states compare for these species? They're the same. Plus five. So that's not factoring in. Back to this central atom oxidation state in a moment when we go back to this case. So what the heck is the difference? Why is this the more stable base? Why does this have a lower effective negative charge density than this? It must be true because this is a stronger acid. A good deal stronger acid than this. 
I don't remember the Ka values, but I think this is about maybe a thousand times stronger than this, something like that. HOClO2 is not quite a strong acid. It's got a K value that's lower than that for hydronium ion. But you know K for nitric is stronger than hydronium ion. We've been through this. The answer comes from shape, structure, hybridization. Nitrogen. How's this atom hybridized? What is it? SP2. Chlorine. SP3. So we finally see a significant difference in these two species, don't we? What's the shape of this thing? Trigonal planar. What's this thing? Trigonal pyramidal. So here I have a model for nitrate iron or carbonate iron or any species which have this same valence electron structure and central atom hybridization. Do you recall from 2045 that if I'm going to have a strong pi system, which is required for resonance to be significant, if I'm going to have strong pi bonds, what must be the spatial orientation of the lobes of the orbitals? used to make these pi bonds. Well, for nitrate ion, it has to be p orbitals, because I don't have d orbitals. I can make pi bonds with d orbitals, but I don't have any d orbitals for period two atoms. The lobes of the orbitals to make the pi system must be oriented in space in what fashion relative to each other? They have got to be I heard it. Parallel! You see these orbital lobes? Because every atom in nitrate ion is sp2. That constitutes the sigma system. Every atom for nitrate ion has got a p orbital oriented in space perpendicular to the plane of the species itself. Because as I hold a model like this, we're imagining the nitrate ion lives in this plane. But the p orbital lobes, for which we have p orbital overlap to make the pi system, the p orbital lobes are perpendicular to this plane. And they're all perfectly perpendicular to this plane because the geometry of this thing is planar, flat. Keep this in mind when you work bonus quiz, special quiz three. Upshot, as we've already noticed, now I have maximum orbital overlap of the p orbitals for all component atoms of nitrate ion to give me a strong pi system. You drew pictures of this in 2045, which look like this. Pardon my lousy out artwork. So if I'm going to take a nitrate ion and draw a picture of these p orbital lobes on the board and these p orbital lobes, these, I got a picture that looks kind of messy. If you're careful with your artwork, you can draw it. But the model shows it nicely. The best p orbital overlap to make a pi bond is obtained when all the p orbital lobes are mutually parallel, just like they are for nitrate ion. So guess what we're looking at for resonance to be appreciable for a species? Here's what we're looking at. SP2 hybridization. Planar or flat geometry. That's what we're looking for. Now let's go back and look at this guy. I'm going to take apart the nitrate ion model and turn it into a model of chlorate ion. Trigonal pyramidal.
Notice, for this trigonal pyramidal species, here's my chlorine atom. I don't care how the p orbital lobes for the peripheral oxygen atoms are oriented in space. They cannot be mutually parallel because this damn thing is in flat. It's not planar. The oxygen atoms are still sp2 hybridized if we imagine resonance and pi bonding. But the thing isn't flat. So I cannot get appropriate orbital overlap to give me a strong significant pi system. Upshot by resonance Nitrate ion stabilizes its negative charge density far more effectively than chlorate ion. How can I be bold enough to say this? Because the facts back me up. Nitrate ion is known to be a far weaker, more stable base than chlorate ion. Here's the reason. Now this, in my model, is just signifying a lobe of an orbital that chlorine atom could be could use to make pi bonds. Question. Given that, investigations show there is some resonance, there is some pi bonding for species like chlorate ion, but it's not nearly as effective as it is for nitrate ion because of this geometry. You don't have the orbitals, orbital lobes parallel to each other. So you can't get effective orbital overlap. You can't get nearly as effective pi system as you can for something like nitrate ion. What orbital or orbitals could the central chlorine atom use for pi bonding? Keeping in mind, I trust you remember, you can't make pi bonds with s orbitals. Which means, if I'm going to make pi bonds, I've got to use p or d orbitals. Can chlorine for this chlorate ion use p orbitals for pi bonding? Can chlorine for chlorate ion use p orbitals for pi bonding? That's the question. Yes or no? No, why not? Because all the p orbitals are used up in the hybridization scheme, isn't it? It's sp3. There's no more valence p orbitals available. Aha! But what's chlorine got that nitrogen ain't got? Got d orbitals, doesn't it? So, one language you'll see in chemistry texts to explain pi bonding in something like chlorate ion, even though it's quite weaker than that for nitrate ion, is p pi to d pi. The pi designates pi bonding. p and d mean it's overlap interaction between p orbital and d orbital. And the arrow pointing from p pi to d pi means that the atoms with p pi orbitals, oxygens, supply the electron density to make the pi bond. Because what did I do to take this Lewis picture and turn it into this Lewis picture? To go from this to this, I took a non-bonding pair here, and I advanced it to bonding status. Does it not seem reasonable to you that if I'm going to rearrange electron distribution and in so doing minimize formal charge distribution, I have to move electron density away from something that bears minus formal charge towards something that has plus formal charge? That's all it is. Right? This is plus two. This is minus one. Well, when I turn this picture into this picture, I've reduced the formal charge on central chlorine atom to plus one, and I've re increased the formal charge from this, on this oxygen atom from minus one to zero. Move electron density away from the atom with negative formal charge toward the atom with positive formal charge. So I did it again. When I went from this picture to this picture, I did this. You now had a look at electron pushing for which organic chemists are notoriously and outrageously famous. They do this all the time. It's a simple way to illustrate the development of resonance for species.
when you're drawing pictures. That's all there is to it. Now then, back to this. How about these two acids? This is nitrous acid, not nitric. And this is sulfurous acid, not sulfuric. Well, as is always the case, to get at the difference in acid strengths between these two, I go to Lewis structures for the conjugate bases. Here's nitrite ion. Here's hydrogen sulfide ion. One of the H's left is H plus to give me this. So each species bears a total charge of minus one. Nitrogen is a central atom of lower electronegativity than sulfur. This is an sp2 nitrogen, whereas this is an sp3 sulfur. So I'm already going to argue that if resonance is stabilizing negative charge density for these species, which it does, it's going to stabilize the negative charge density more effectively for this than it will for this. But here I can have P pi D pi resonance stabilization of negative charge density. And then I can say, well, this has got two peripheral oxo oxygens to in stabilize negative charge density by induction, just like this does, because this is not an oxo-oxygen. So then I can say, well, so far, if resonance is better for this, this atom is of greater electronegativity than sulfur. Each got two peripheral oxo oxygens to stabilize negative charge density. Why the hell is this base more stable? Why is this the stronger acid? And it's a good deal stronger. These are the K values. This is about 80 times stronger than this. What's going on here? So I'll look at one other factor, which is yet we haven't mentioned explicitly, but implicitly. Hey, oxidation state for this sulfur atom is what? What's the oxidation state? You know how to play the game. Parcel the electrons. Sulfur is an atomic member of family number six. So six less two gives you what oxidation state? Plus four. Well, let's play the same game here. Oxidation state? What is it? Plus three. Tell me, Coulomb, which positive charge, plus three or plus four, will do a better job of stabilizing negative charge density? Plus four, isn't it, Coulomb? So, we added another consideration to our bag of tricks, our collection of factors. And simply put, for questions which I ask you about this kind of stuff on the final, and you know there's going to be a bunch of these, Hey, there's your bag of tricks. Keep those in mind. Backed up by understanding. In fact, for the final, if you want to write down these bag of tricks and bring them with you, I don't care. It's okay with me. Because what counts is your understanding of these, not a list thereof. Does charge to size ratio have anything to do with this? Charge to size ratio. Size to well, size-wise, here's the part of this that matters, because you're not going to traipse any negative charge density over to this thing, because this thing is not an oxo-oxygen. So size-wise, this is a little bit bigger. So that would support the conclusion that this is somewhat a weaker base. All right? Now then. That leaves one more consideration. I don't know that we'll get to the hydrated metal ions. I don't care. You want to read about the hydrated metal ions? It's in the notes. 
All I ask is that you recognize that the factors which apply to rationalizing the strength of a hydrated metal ion are not these. <laughs> That's a charge density issue of the central metal ion. And it's coulombically based. It's not a difficult case at all. So take a look at that. Maybe I'll ask one question about this stuff on the final with my giving you the responsibility this time of learning about this stuff by reading about it. I think it's a page. I think you can survive that. So let's wrap it up with this versus this. Because I think you remember. So far, when we tried to rationalize the difference in strengths for a collection of in-family acids, HF, HCl, HBr, HI, we found out that the charge to size ratio is what mattered the most. But when we, when, when we applied this to a series of acids which are related by being derived from elements which are in the same period, we came up with the electronegativity argument as the argument which supports the facts. And that, of course, allows us to recognize why this is a stronger acid than this. Even though chloride ion is derived from chlorine, which is more electronegative than bromine, this is still the weaker and more stable base. If you want to include F minus, same consideration applies. This being derived from the atom of greatest electronegativity. Based again on electronegativity, you'd argue that HF is a stronger acid than this, but that don't fit the facts. So the hell with that argument. We thought about it, but we recognize it doesn't work. Charge to size ratio works, because this is a lot bigger ion than this. Now let's look at these two. To look at those two, I can take this picture that I've already drawn. perchlorate ion and turn it into perchlorate ion. I now have a Lewis picture, four species with one, two, three, four peripheral oxo oxygens, an sp3 hybridized central atom, which means tetrahedral geometry overall. I can play this game and talk about resonance and talk about resonance being a factor but not as significant for something which is planar and central atom sp2 hybridized like for nitrate ion and carry on to realize that if I'm going to look at the difference in acid strength between per perchloric acid and perbromic acid these two this is a tough call Because other than difference in central atom, these things are identical. And chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0 on the Pauling scale, bromine 2.8. Really close. Which one is larger? This will be the larger ion, won't it? Because bromine's a bigger atom than chlorine. So based on size, which Ion would I argue to be the weaker, more stable base. This, the perbromate ion, or this, the perchlorate ion, based on size. Which would I argue to be the weaker, more stable base? This one. But now I look at the facts and I find out this acid is stronger. So what's going on here? Can't be the size factor that matters. Now then, one of the things you talked about yesterday in discussion class relates to this. It's called the principle of maximum overlap. How would the principle of maximum overlap apply to perbromate ion versus perchlorate ion? Or more to the point, between chlorine and oxygen or bromine and oxygen? Between which pair of atoms would I expect to find stronger bonds? Chlorine oxygen, bromine oxygen. Chlorine oxygen because they're closer in size. 
So I'll get more effective orbital overlap. So now I got an argument pulled from my bag of tricks that supports the conclusion that perchlorate ion is the weaker, more stable base. And that's true. So we'll use that argument. But let's take a look at one more size aspect. And that is, we've recognized between HCl and HBr, we got two choices, that's it. It's electronegativity or charge to size ratio. Nothing else can apply. And we found out that the charge to size ratio applies. And we went over here to perbromate and perchlorate and said, if we're going to base this on the charge to size ratio, we're going to conclude perbromate is the weaker, more stable base. But that's not true. So here's a case where we're looking at acids which come from elements that are in the same family where the charge to size ratio is not holding. It did for H, F, and H, Cl, and H, Br, and H, I, but it doesn't for these. Point. Between chloride ion and bromide ion, there's a big difference in size. Between perchlorate ion and perbromate ion, is there a big difference in size? The answer is no. These are much closer in size than chloride ion and bromide ion. A simple way to show that is to play the game we're now going to play. Let's imagine that the area of a bromine atom is twice the area more or less of a chlorine atom, which in turn is twice the area more or less of an oxygen atom. Okay? Because as I see it, charge density needs to be considered on a surface area basis, not a volume basis. Because this charge is on the surface, more or less. So, let's make a picture. Here's chlorine and bromine. This is twice the size of this. So I can expect when I turn this into bromide ion and turn this into chloride ion, this will be about twice the size as this. That gives me my big size difference. But what happens when I start gluing on these oxygen atoms? Move this over. What happens to the difference in size now? If you play this game, you can see how it works. Bromine, two chlorines, size-wise, based on area. But how about this? ClO4 minus versus BrO4 minus. Because ClO4 minus is a half a bromine plus one, two, three, four oxygens which is how many bromines? Hmm? It's one, isn't it? Okay, so this becomes 1.5 bromines. What's that? Two. So look what I did with the size ratio. If I had bromine atom, chlorine atom, this is two times this. But look what happened to the size ratio when I added these oxygen atoms. Now it's 2 to 1.5. Not nearly as big, as near, not nearly as bigger as bromide versus chloride. It's like taking a penny and a nickel. Nickel's five pennies. A nickel is worth five times a penny. Now let me take my nickel and add five pennies to it. Let me take my penny and add five pennies to it. What's the monetary ratio now? Nickel versus penny, five to one. But now I've turned my nickel into a dime. Right? I added five pennies to it. And I turned my penny into a nickel plus a penny. That's six cents. 5 to 1 became 10 to 6, not even 2 to 1 anymore. Same idea as this. All right? That's enough.